of uh, Psalm 57 is, Let your glory be over all the earth. Now, indeed, God's glory is there because of his creation, but that has been besmirched by the disobedience of man for whom the world was made, uh, for him to live in and to have dominion over. And so, therefore, how does the glory, how is the glory spread over all the earth? And it surely is by the gospel of Christ, by the, the saving, the soul-saving power of his sacrifice on the cross, by his ministry and by his own glory. That is how the glory is spread, his glory is spread upon the earth. And of course, uh, we're studying uh, the history of the beginning of that spread of the gospel. And uh, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the end of Paul's third uh, missionary journey in the book of Acts. So we're in Acts chapter 20. I, I have the, uh, the guilt to admit that I have learned an awful lot about Acts <laughs> that I didn't know already. And uh, I am guilty of, being, of having made assumptions and so forth, uh, especially about the character of Paul, uh, that have been dashed uh, during this uh, program. And so I'm well rid of them, uh, as I hope you are too. Well, maybe you did know all about those things, and you've been happy watching me learn them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Paul... I'd just like to do a little review in, in chapter 19, verse 30 and 31. It says, this is during the riot in Ephesus, and it says, but Paul wished to go in among the crowd. Uh, the, the disciples would not let him. Uh, and even some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. So we... You know, we sometimes define Paul as a real dry, driven person. And we add the sort of human uh, part of that uh, driving person as a, as, a, as a juggernaut, as it were. But he wasn't. Uh, indeed, uh, he, he wanted to go out there in order to support the people who were suffering. Uh, yet he was advised not to go. And he did not go. He obeyed his friends who told him not to. So, uh, beginning with uh, verse 1 of chapter 20, uh, it says, After the uproar, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. Now, uh, in other words, he got everybody together. They will have had a good meeting. He's been there for quite some time. And it's now time for him to move on. He's going to Macedonia, uh, which is to the northwest. He's uh, going to be taking a ship uh, up to probably Philippi uh, uh, from uh, Ephesus. But, and here is where things get a little complicated because uh, in a short uh, and it's just, uh, it's just only several verses, quite a lot of ground is covered. It says that when they had gone through those regions, they were given them much encouragement, they came to Greece. So he went up into Macedonia. Remember in his uh, second missionary journey, he went to Macedonia and also, wound, uh, also to Corinth. Uh, he is going to go through those old uh, those places that he set up, encouraging them, and then he's going to come down to Corinth again. And this has a dual purpose, because 
he had prepared them for uh, giving money uh, to uh, the, these believers in Jerusalem who were uh, in sad shape. And so this uh, traveling is going to be encouraging and also picking up the funds for Jerusalem. We'll see that because we'll see in, uh, in verse, uh, he spent, uh, where he spent three months, it says he spent three months in Greece. Uh, and then you'll see a bunch of people being added to the group that is going to leave and come down uh, to uh, come down to Jerusalem with him to deliver the money. And he had, in his, in his telling, uh, we see him telling this to uh, Corinth to set money aside and uh, that uh, he would accompany it and, and they were free to have people accompany the money as well to make sure that everything was going correctly. Uh, so one thing I have to add here before we proceed further is we have to go to uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. And it says, when I came to Troas to preach, this is in verse 12, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. All right, so in their, in their trip up from Ephesus, they will have stopped in Troas. Now, they're going to stop in Troas on the way back again, okay? But they stopped in Troas, and this is, this is a, the, the bit of a puzzle about Acts. This part is that, that Luke never uh, mentions Titus. And he doesn't even mention Titus anonymously, saying uh, that uh, somebody was sent forth. Now, r the thing is that... Uh, Paul wrote the first letter, what we call the first Corinthians, he wrote that from uh, Ephesus. We know that he wrote it from Ephesus because we see the people who are on the greetings at the end of the letter. We see that Priscilla and Aquila are there. Now remember, at the uh, end of his second missionary journey, he took Priscilla and Aquila from uh, Corinth and took them for, to Ephesus. And so he wrote that letter, which is a, a very strong uh, admonishment, letter of admonishment. And then he started to worry about how they received it, whether they were defeated by it or encouraged by it or split by it or, or what was the result. And he had no information. So he sent Titus, long, long before the riot in Ephesus, he'd sent Titus to go there and the arrangement, he already intended to come up to Troas because he was going to go through Macedonia and come back down to Greece. This is in the third journey, remember? So he, he sent Titus on ahead. None of that is told to us in Acts. <laughs> so when he gets to Troas and finds that Titus isn't there, even though they're willing to listen to him, and want him to minister to them, he's not ready to do it. He immediately gets on a ship and gets to Philippi, and then he meets up with Titus, okay, and gets the good news that, in fact, they have repented and they are working on it. But also he gets the bad news that, in fact, they haven't accepted the person back in who, had, uh, who needed to be thrown out for a while, uh, that they hadn't forgiven him and done the right thing. So what we call 2 Corinthians is almost certainly written on the road through, uh, during his journey through Macedonia because that gets down to them before he does and that's there where he's repeating the need for them to set aside money uh, for the saints in Jerusalem. <clears throat> so what happens here is that uh, he's... He's there, he's, he comes, he, he's now come to Greece. He's there for three months when a plot is made against him. This is in verse 3 of Acts chapter 20. 
A plot is made against him as he is about to set sail for Syria. So he was going to sail across uh, from Corinth. Well, there's a, there's a seaport on the other end of that uh, uh, peninsula. He was going to sail probably directly to Ephesus. But he found out about a plot. Now, if you wanted to, if you want to kill somebody, a ship is an ideal place to murder somebody because you can dispose of the body immediately. <laughs> and then the fishes do the rest, okay? <laughs> now, uh, remember in, uh, in uh, first century uh, life, light was at a premium. And so the night was a deep night. And things could be done during the night that no one would witness. So they got wind of this plan that he would be murdered uh, on uh, the trip over. And so what happened then, they changed their plan and came back by f on foot, coming up around the top, uh, uh, going back into Macedonia, coming down through uh, those towns, down to Philippi, and then probably a ship at that point from Philippi uh, to Troas. And so that's how they've all wound up in Troas. One more thing about the stay in Corinth, and that is that that's probably where Romans was written. And the reason is, well, he was there for three months. I think he said, was it two or three months? He was three months. He was there for three months, so he had a bit of time on his hands. And then uh, we see the greeters at the end of the book of Romans they are from Corinth. Not all of them, but some of them are Corinth, and Timothy is there as well. I think Timothy is a greeter at the end of the book of Romans. So that's where he wrote Romans. Okay. So now uh, he's coming back, and here in verse 4 we see the people uh, being mispronounced by this preacher, Sopater and the Berean, uh, the, Berean the son of Pharis, accompanied him, and the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derb, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychius, and Trophimus. These, okay, so these are the guys who are, uh, are accompanying the money that's going to go to uh, Jerusalem. And in verse 5 it says, they went ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. Uh, for some reason, Paul wanted to cross a tiny peninsula uh, uh, between uh, and, and do the last part on, on foot. And now we got, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to Troas. So what we're going to find is that in verse 16 of chapter 20, we hear, we see that uh, Paul is trying to make it to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So Pentecost is 50 days uh, bef before the beginning, 50 days from the beginning of the, uh, the week of unleavened bread, uh, the, the week of Passover week, I believe it is, the beginning of it. So the clock is ticking, all right, because we see that they have not left Philippi uh, until uh, the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I don't want to go into this, this whole uh, thing about the, the feasts and about Christians observing the feasts right now. Because if we, if we leave it until Paul actually gets to Jerusalem and, uh, and things become really ugly, uh, it's, a good, it's a much better time. We've got more information about it. It's a much better time to dig into that part of uh, what should be our uh, doctrinal appreciation uh, under grace. Uh, so, uh, so, so the clock is ticking, and uh, as luck would have it, a, a two-day voyage uh, turns into a five-day voyage. It should only have been two days to get from Philippi to Troas, but it took five days, so they must have had contrary winds. And so, uh, and so then the stay in Troas is going to be truncated uh, because of the, 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 the clock ticking, okay? And, uh, and they stayed seven days. 
Okay, so verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, when they were gathered together to break bread. Oh, this is the first sign that Sunday is becoming the church day. Uh, he prolonged his speech until midnight. So he's doing a lot of talking, but then again, he's got a lot of talking to do. He hasn't spoken to these people. He hasn't mapped out the whole, uh, the whole picture, the prophecies about Christ, also the uh, anecdotal uh, information, because at the moment we have an oral history uh, of Christ's ministry because we don't have any of the uh, any of the uh, Gospels written yet. There, some people do speculate that Matthew was the first to write and that he could have been writing in the 50s. We're actually at, uh, I think we're in uh, 58, the year 58 right now. And so it's conceivable that some of, uh, some of that would have gone out. But uh, nevertheless, he's got a lot to tell them. <clears throat> And there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered. And it says, And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. Now I know that none of you sleep during my sermons. <laughs> I know. You're just closing your eyes so that you can concentrate better, okay? <laughs> When, when Joe was uh, doing the bulletin, he said, is this going to be a long sermon? <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> this poor lad uh, fell three stories and, uh, and was taken up dead. Now, we know that uh, Luke was there, and Luke is a physician. And physicians, for the most part, can tell some, if somebody's dead. Okay, and I trust Luke when he said he was dead. This guy was dead. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms, that do not be alarmed for this, for his life is in him. We, uh, we visited one of Sandra's cousins, a very sweet woman. She was dying of cancer. And I had taken uh, juice and bread so that we could give her communion. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in fact, her aunt was there as well. And she, the aunt said to, her name was Kay, the patient, Kay, I'll be back next week. Uh, I'll be back on Tuesday. I'll see you. She says, I don't, know, I don't think I'm going to be here on Tuesday. Okay. So uh, we gave her uh, the, the tiny bit of bread, tiny, tiny, and read the scriptures and prayed, gave her, the, and she started to choke on the bread. And I thought, oh, I was praying. I thought, Lord, no, don't, don't let me have, have killed her with, uh, with, uh, with your sacrament, you know. And, <laughs> She got it down, <laughs> and then and then the juice was easier. Okay, but I, I when I read this, you know, Paul realizes that uh, that he has been uh, a party to this uh, this tragedy. And while it doesn't record it, I know what would be going on in Paul's mind is please, 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 God, you know, because uh, I've I've been I've been at fault here. So uh, he then then in verse eleven it says, and Paul. Uh, had gone up and had broken bread and eaten. And you see the, you see the, uh, uh, the difference. Uh, broken bread is not eating, it's remembering the Lord. And then he had also eaten as well, had some dinner. Uh, and he continued until daybreak, which uh, will have been fairly late, uh, late-ish, because remember we're uh, in March here, March or April, so he will have spoken till maybe about five o'clock in the morning, five or six o'clock in the morning, a daybreak uh, in, uh, in uh, Turkey at that time. Uh, and they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. They were much comforted 
by uh, the, uh, res uh, the resurrecting of this young man. Uh, but going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there. Sorry, Assos is where he has actually walked. I was wrong. It's not the Philippi. It's the other. It, this gets pretty complicated, okay? It took me hours to unravel it. <clears throat> uh, and I still get it wrong. <sighs> anyway, so uh, he had gone, uh, 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 he had walked a part of it across this uh, peninsula, small peninsula, almost really a headland. And then we met us, he met us at Assos. We took him on board and went to Mytilene. Uh, and sailing from there, we came the following day to Chios. This is just ports uh, uh, on the uh, western uh, coast of what is now Turkey. Touched at Samos, and the day after that, we went to Miletus. Now, that's now south of Ephesus, okay? And it says, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So he deliberately sailed past uh, Ephesus. In other words, he had picked a ship that wasn't stopping there. He's not going to be able to tell the ship what to do. But he deliberately got that bo a ship because he didn't want to get embroiled again uh, in Ephesus because he wanted to make it a quick visit. Yet he wanted to speak to the Ephesian elders. <clears throat> so at Miletus, uh, he sent for the Ephesians. Uh, uh, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Roughly forty odd miles, so it would be uh, two days for the messenger to get there, and then maybe three days for the elders who won't be able to walk as quite quickly as the, uh, the messenger, maybe. So there's five days right away, and the clock is ticking. Okay. Now they have arrived. The, uh, the elders of Ephesus have arrived. And... Uh, He says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humiliation, humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. In other words, his ministry was both a public ministry and also a personal ministry. He was very busy. He was in people's houses talking to families as well as preaching, from, uh, preaching uh, to crowds testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. Now, uh, I found in this that Paul uh, has Paul is immensely dedicated, very strong, uh, yet um, soft and loving uh, and emotional. And also, he doesn't do something until he's told to in terms of moving. He lets years go by before he does something. If we take his history, he comes, he's, he goes to, to uh, Damascus. He's saved. He comes back to Jerusalem. He is told uh, by a spirit uh, to 
leave Jerusalem and get out of town. So the group sends him to Tarsus, which is where he's from. How many years is he in Tarsus? He waits in Tarsus for years until Barnabas shows up and brings him to Antioch, where he also spends a lot of time waiting for the ministry to begin until he is told to move off. They, the, the elders at Antioch, remember, are uh, uh, told to separate out for uh, the ministry, Barnabas and uh, Paul, and, and so they leave. They go to Cyprus and they go up into Asia on the first journey, and they come back again. <clears throat> He's been to Jerusalem at least twice before this time. He's been to Jerusalem when he went to the council to find out whether they were doing the right thing or not because of the people who were preach had come from Jerusalem up to Antioch to disturb people with uh, the, the dogma uh, of uh, the law. And he's also been there after his second missionary journey. He travels there and says they went, he went up to uh, meet with the church. He went up to Jerusalem. But it was sort of incognito. Now his reputation has become very strong in Jerusalem, and the Jews are ready to kill him. They hate him. They have spread a lot of rumors about him, much of it untrue, but, but, but some of it really true and good, and because they're bad. And so what's waiting for him this time is not a Jerusalem like the other two visits. Okay, and there might be a third visit I might have missed. So he knows that trouble is waiting. But Paul would not go there unless he was told to. He says he's constrained by the Spirit. So this isn't some half-baked plan of his. There's some, some idea that uh, he should do it. He's being told to do it. He says, I don't... Uh, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So, <clears throat> he knows that it's going to be the end. Some fashion or other, it's going to be the end of what's going on. But what does he say? But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish the course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I believe that as we, as Jesus becomes more valuable to us, we become less valuable to ourselves. And the Lord Jesus is very valuable to Paul. We, it may be a, a something to do with old age as well, as I am getting old, but the striving goes away, and the worry goes away. We see the grace of God. We see his wonderful, wonderful salvation. And we realize that we, we won't really ever reach anything in this life that will be sublime. The sublime, the sublime coming together of us in reality it's not going to happen until we come into the presence of Christ himself. There's, there's, no, there's no finished fantastic work to be done here. Just obedience to him. He says, 
And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. He tells them that he's going. Therefore I testify to you, you to you this day, that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. How important this verse is. The whole counsel of God. Isn't that really what is going wrong in the church today? That people are not preaching the whole counsel of God. Okay? They are making it more fashionable. And it isn't fashionable. You know, you can tell when a civilization is about to be utterly destroyed, when it starts talking about offending somebody being a crime. Well, if we're worried about being offended, then we're not much use. Because we need to accept the offense that we are to God. What an offense we are. And he's the only one who's truly offended. And he has had mercy on us through Christ. Don't offend me. We then, we then wind up with this offending thing on the reef of subjectivity. And look how good man is when he's in a subjective state of mind. He can come up with all sorts of insane, stupid things. What about evolution? What about evolution? You can't prove it. You can't, you can't countenance it. It is the most ludicrous thing, and it is, it is, the drum is beaten loud to drown out. It's like, the, it's like Ephesus, where they say, Great is the uh, Empress Diana. If you scream it loud enough, it becomes true, right? The, uh, the universe is billions of years old. And, and, and the, whole, the whole point of it is that we're not made. We just happened. And so if we just happened, we don't have responsibilities to anybody. There's nobody we're offending. <clears throat> After all, if you're that stupid to believe it, you're going to believe a lot of other things besides about people who think they can be made into a different gender or something like this. That's, that's where that stupidity comes from. It just gets more and more stupid until there's an army at the gate. There'll be an army at the gate because we've lost our minds. And they'll take us and we'll deserve it. Nineveh all over again. Pay careful attention. Now remember that he's talking to elders. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. The first duty of an elder is to make sure he behaves properly. You, you're, the first obedience is you. Because if he can take you out, he can take out a bunch of other people. So the devil is always interested in laying traps for elders. And he comes up with some beauties. He's very smart, much smarter than we are. But of course, we know that the person who is within us is greater than him. So the first order of business for an elder is to stay out of trouble. And to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. It's a responsibility that has to be taken very seriously. And then he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. 
Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish you with one with every one with tears. Now, in uh, in Titus, in the letter to Titus, he sa t says that the the elders are are, are uh, to be ready to rebuke uh, false doctrine, not only recognize it to be. To, but to rebuke it. And in fact, later in the passage, it says, these people must be silenced. So not only must you, as an elder, know uh, the doctrine, you must uh, also be ready to defend it, be ready to see its attacks, and to aggressively, to aggressively silence these people. You've got to be ready to do all of those things. If you're not, don't become an elder. It's like the village that, that thinks it's okay, but it's in a dangerous place. It needs to build a wall around it, and it needs to have people walking along that wall watching. He says, I know that these wolves are coming. We have to watch. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an in the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those of who were with me, he would allow no alloy in the work. He would allow no question about his dedication or his motives. It really is remarkable. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the Lord himself spoke that we should not be worried about uh, what we will eat and what we will wear. We should not be concerned. We should not be like the Gentiles who run after all of these things, wanting to become wealthy, thinking that it will buttress them against every harm. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. So this trip to Jerusalem is going to be a trip of confrontation. And we'll get to it. It's pretty complicated. But it's also uh, interesting. You know, Paul, just like the Lord, Paul's had many plots of murder against him, and he's avoided it. And he will eventually be killed in Rome. So the Romans did the job. The Jews wanted to do it, but the Romans wound up doing it. A bit the same way as with the Lord himself. Because Rome is the one who allowed it to happen, or actually made it happen. Of course, with the encouragement and the, the, the conspiracy and the, and the corrupt uh, religious uh, leadership. But nevertheless, Rome bears that responsibility as well. So there's no mistakes. And we'll see that some, someone said, if this man had not appealed to Caesar, he would have gone free. No, that's not the case. No, there were no mistakes here. Paul was going to come like a, like a, a spear into the, uh, 
the establishment, and they're going to, they want to instantly want to kill him. The truth is not popular in this world. <clears throat> so, we will uh, proceed to Jerusalem next week. Let's pray. Actually, uh, I'd like, I'm sorry, I'd like to read something to you first. This is uh, Spurgeon. I'm not sure if I've read it before, because I am getting old and I forget these things. But maybe you'll have forgotten it too. <laughs> I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Psalm 16, 8. This is Charles Spurgeon. This is the way to live, with God always before us. We shall have the noblest companion, the holiest example, the sweetest consolation, and the mightiest influence. This must be a resolute act of the mind I have set, and it must be maintained as a set and settled thing, always to have an eye to the Lord, an eye to the Lord's eye, and an ear for the Lord's voice. This is the right state for the godly man. His God is near, filling the horizon of his vision, leading the way of his life, and furnishing the theme of his meditation. What vanities would we should avoid, what sins we should overcome, what virtues we should exhibit, what joys we should experience if we did indeed set the Lord always before us. Why not? This is the way to be safe. The Lord being ever in our minds, we come to feel safety and certainty because of his being so near. He is at our right hand to guide us and aid us, and hence we are not moved by fear, nor force, nor fraud, nor fickleness. When God stands at a man's right hand, that man is himself sure to stand. Come on, then, ye foemen of the truth. Rush against me like a furious tempest, if ye will. God upholds me. God abides with me. Whom shall I fear? Now let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your great salvation. Thank you, Father, for making a way for our sins to be atoned for by the sacrifice of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that we now are no longer an offense to you, but that we are a friend, even in your family, as your children, all because of what your Son, your blessed Son, did for us, and no other could have done. And then it's his name we pray these things. Amen.